Dark Side of the Moon was released on March 1st, 1973, produced by Pink Floyd and engineered by Alan Parsons and mixed by Chris Thomas. It has 10 songs and it's a shade under 43 minutes. The album cover is by Storm Thorgerson of Hypnosis. It's uh, actually pretty iconic with the um, prism looking triangle and the rainbow and the light coming through the prism as a rainbow. Uh, interesting that on this CD version, which is a, a version from 1992 remaster, it does say Pink Floyd, The Dark Side of the Moon. The original album didn't have that on vinyl. And uh, this this is mine I bought in the mid-90s. And uh, it's got pretty good, you know, for mid-90s, they weren't all about the glitz and glam in these remasters, but it does have lyrics and pictures in it. And uh, pretty interesting. And um, yeah, the, the credits are in the back here. You got the pyramids. And you do have some photos of the band on this one right here. Uh, let me show you the back. The back of the CD looks like this. And uh, it's kind of a plain looking CD um, like that. Yeah. I don't know if you guys can see that, but it's got the prism on it and everything. And then um, I got another version here, which isn't mine, but uh, my spouse's has got. This is the 94 remaster, I think. Uh, it's also, uh, it's just a different one. I don't know. But it's got, it's a little bit different. This one looks like they did better packaging, uh, better pictures on the inside and pic more pictures of the band. There's the pyramids. Updated photos and lyrics and everything. Yeah, so that's it. I mean, they sound dramatically different because this one, um, this one has definitely got more going on with it in terms of surround sound and uh, coding and stuff. And uh, especially if you're in the car or the truck, you can really hear the music moving around. But uh, enough about that. That's not what you guys want to hear about. This is a concept album, and it's about life and death and some of the things in between that cause heartburn or issues or pain points in your life. Uh, but mainly just about, you could just say it's about life. This is a, it's a progressive rock, space rock, radio rock, album rock, psychedelic rock, everything. Uh, it's not country, but... Uh, it's not trying to be country. It it what it does have is it has a universal appeal, and it's a real broad appeal. And it does have a pop element to it. You would even say it's easier to listen to than something like Close to the Edge or in the Court of the Crimson King or something like that, where you think of those as super proggy. This is prog, but it's not super proggy. Sometimes prog becomes uh, to the average person not very listenable or not very appealing but this one is and um what else this is it's like the crescendoing escalating talent of the band um coming together and what what you could seem as or even describe as a perfect 43 minutes and you gotta you gotta put it into perspective too i mean these guys were coming off of adam hart mother metal and obscured by clouds nobody really saw this coming and, you know, they even were talking internally about, like, this could be, um, this could be the final album. They wanted to go big packaging and make a big to-do about it. Especially after, like, Metal, I've read some things in the book that, um, you know, the band was kind of at a low point and getting ready, you know, not sure what's coming around. And then, you know, they produce a masterpiece like this. So, wow. Okay, what does it sound like? Uh, other than the things I've already just mentioned, you know, Roger Waters and David Gilmour always disagreed on how to mix these records, and this one in particular. They pulled in an independent record producer named Chris Thomas to do the mix, and uh, he kind of, like, got it just right. Where If you've ever listened to a Roger Waters solo album, it's really, like, volume up, volume down, really fast, really slow, but it's, like, all, you know... He's kind of all over the place musically, and that's how he likes to mix his albums too. David Gilmour, if you've ever listened to his solo stuff or um, A Momentary Lapse of Reason or Division Bell, he's like, he likes a more um, vanilla, I guess. There aren't these huge volume up, volume down moments, and it's more all sort of um, homogenized, I'll say. And so what Chris Thomas did was he struck the balance between the two of them and got it right. And of course, you know, Alan Parsons is legendary. He, you know, if you read the book, 
I don't have the book handy, but um, uh, it set the controls by, um, uh, I'm sorry, a saucer, a saucer Full of Secrets, A Saucer Full of Something by uh, Nicholas Schaffner. I've already forgotten the name of it. I don't have it handy, but he, he talks about how important Alan Parsons was to this album doing the clocks and the ticking and the cash registers and all that stuff. So, uh, okay, that's a five-minute introduction. That's enough. Let's get, um, oh, last thing. A friend gave me the tape of this in high school, and it lived in my first car, the Dodge Colts, for um, the whole time I had that car. I don't know what happened to that tape, <laughs> but you know, I've had, I've, I've been listening to this since like 90, 93, maybe, maybe even before that. Um, anyway, first track, let's call it track one A and one B. So track one A is "Speak to Me." It's written by Nick Mason, credited to Mason. And uh, it's a minute and seven seconds. And what it, what it's really just the introduction to the album. And you hear the heartbeat and then the clocks ticking. And um, I've been mad for years, fucking whatever he says. You know, what's that guy doing gibberish? And it's just really an instrumental that serves as the opening to the album. The second um, part of it is 1B, which is Breathe in the Air, which is written by Gilmore Wright and Waters. It's two minutes and 45 seconds. And it, it features um, David Gilmore's steel guitar, or uh, uh, maybe he's just playing with a slide. But uh, it's in the key of E minor, and that's the relative minor of G major. And uh, so, like you just see, if you look at the sheet music, there's just one sharp in the uh, in the key signature. It's 64 beats per minute in four four time, and the verse is. It's David Gilmore, Breathe, Breathe in the Air. He's got lead vocals on this one. And it's a 16-bar verse. And then the chorus is, uh, For long you live and high you fly, but only if you ride the tide. It's an 8-bar chorus. And that's pretty much the opening track. It's so um, it's like the perfect beginning to an album. And uh, it's so popular that Pink Floyd used this when they played at Live 8. Um, back into, let me think, 2005 maybe? Anyway, Breathe in the Air is uh, verse, chorus, verse, chorus, and that's the song. And then it segues into On the Run, which is written by Gilmore and Waters, 3 minutes and 31 seconds. There's a, uh, of note, there, most of the, all that stuff you hear is a synthy AKS-8 note sequence. And if you've ever seen Pink Floyd live at Pompeii or Dark Side of the Moon, the classic albums, which I have the DVD here right behind me. Um, you can see them working on it, playing with that thing. Dun, 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 and then they speed it up, and what you hear is a... The notes are E, G, A, G, D, C, D, E. And there's all kinds of, like... I don't know, they made they made sounds of, like, engines, like, or airplanes or whatever. That's in the key of G major. It's 159 beats per minute at 4-4 time. And that's pretty much the whole thing. And if you've ever watched a Chicago Bulls game, especially in the 90s when they would do their introductions, like when the visiting team was doing their introductions, that's what you'd hear is on the run. <laughs> that's that's an important piece of trivia right there you should know. Now what's interesting about this album is for most of the songs, there aren't really breaks. Like The tracks just seamlessly go into the next track. Track three is Time. It's credited to Gilmore Mason, Wright and Waters, and it's seven minutes and five seconds. And lead vocals by David Gilmore. One of, uh, and Rick Wright in one spot. One of my favorites on the album is Time. And it's a it's a radio play on classic rock radio. But, uh, you know, when you think about it, all these songs are played on rock radio. Uh, but this one, you'll hear it a lot. And you can hear... Um, like, I used to listen to WAPL back in the day when I was at work or wherever or driving around. and um, uh, Sometime they play even play these songs back to back. And, well, anyway, Nick Mason is the key to this to time as he has the big introduction, the drum spot, you know, the whole, you know. It's in the key of A major, 128 beats per minute, and has, like, a cut feel time to it but you can tap it out in four four like that it's pretty quick the intro is um the clocks the clocks and the bells 
And it's from 22 seconds to 41, at 41 seconds, and that's when the tick-tock starts. The first note is at 57 seconds, that bum. And it has a long build-up to the Nick Mason drum part, which starts around 1 minute and 20 seconds-ish. Then at 2.29 is when Nick Mason does the whole... And then it kicks into the verse. And David Gilmore sings, ticking away the moments that make up a dull day. It's a 15-bar verse, which is unusual. Unusual for 15 bars, but I count, I so unusual that I counted it twice just to make sure it wasn't 16 bars. The chorus is, uh, tired of lying in the sunshine. Da, 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 da. It's uh, vocals by Rich Richard Wright. And I think I've said this before on other albums like Obscured by Clouds and Metal. I really like his vocals. And um, especially in the 70s, he just had a he had a great way of singing and sounding great. And he it's enough like Gilmore, but it's definitely you can tell it's not David Gilmore. It's a different person. Um, after the, you know, the verses and choruses, there is a guitar solo, which is very long. And I counted at 46 bars, which I think that's very long for a Pink Floyd song. It wouldn't be long for like a 70s Rush song, but for a. Uh, uh, for David Gilmore, that's a long one. You know, and they really make the most of it with the background vocals and um, and everything. So great solo. And then at the end of the song is the breathe reprise, which is it goes back to the uh, breathe in the air tempo and music, and then um, home home again is what David Gilmore sings. And the breathe reprise is thirty four bars total. It's it's shorter than the guitar solo. <laughs> it's a verse, chorus, guitar, verse, chorus, and then the breathe reprise. That's time. Track four is The Great Gig in the Sky. It's uh, vocals by Tori, Claire Tory, and uh, it's a track written by Richard Wright. It's four minutes and 47 seconds. The studio version is brilliant, and... You know, it it starts out with do 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 and then and then she starts singing. And by the way, I also enjoy the version that's on Pink Floyd Pulse, this blinking light that's behind me. Uh it's about it's about the only thing I like on Pink Floyd Pulse. The second disc has Dark Side of the Moon. If you've ever listened to it, you probably don't love it, but I do like the version of the Grey Gig in the Sky. They have three vocalists, which uh, they take turns. So the the and this is not the right order, but I think Sam Brown is first, actually. And um, Claudia Fontaine and, and Durga McBroom, they each get a chance to, to do their Claire Tory expression or impression. Uh, this song, the song features the big, big organ from Richard Wright and David Gilmer on slide guitar. And, and they're at t- times when, you know, Richard is slamming so hard on that organ, it it's almost more powerful than Claire Torrey's vocals. Uh, anyway, the song is in the key of B minor, and it's 60 beats per minute and 4-4 time. And, um, you know, Claire Torrey, what, they had a bunch of different singers try this, but um, in the studio they told Claire Torrey to just go out and um, pretend like it's a song about dying is what they told her. And, you know, she's just basically screaming and wailing. But it is it is really cool. And the song winds down and reboots at... Two minutes and thirty seconds, and then another reboot at three thirty-eight, and um, I don't know. You can almost think of those like extra verses, or uh, <laughs> however you want to think of that. But those are two different moments in the song later in the song where it's like the song is resetting again. Uh, so yeah, that's the great gig in the sky. I think that's the end of the first side too, if I'm not mistaken. I could be wrong. Uh, track five on Dark Side of the Moon is Money. And I, I would just be curious. I've never owned this on vinyl. And there's no clues as to how they split it. But uh, I, me- I mentioned earlier that most of these tracks just segue seamlessly into one another. But Money is like, there's a clear break when Money starts. Like the great gig of the, in the sky ends and then Money starts. And it's a, um, a totally different vibe. There's no, like, overlap between the outro and the intro. 
Uh, let's see. What about money? Saxophone by Dick Perry. It's written by Roger Waters and it's six minutes and 23 seconds. And, um, I suppose the cash registers and the change being counted at the beginning is what people like about the song. It's okay. It's just got a cool vibe going in it. It's in the key of B minor and it's 130 beats per minute in seven, four, or I guess seven, eight time. Um, I saw, I saw music scored at seven, four. So let's just call it 7-4. But there isn't much difference. Um, the verse is money, get away, 12 bars. And uh, it's 12 bars total verse with new car caviar, four car daydream, think I'll buy me a football team. That's the, that four bars at the end. Um, that's the, that's like a lot of people like that part of the song. I like that part of the song. That's just the end of the 12 bars. It's not a chorus. Uh, it's just how they end the verses. And lead vocals are by David Gilmore. I, I, you know, I, back when I wasn't too attuned as to what was really going on in the music, I actually thought that was Roger Waters singing for a long time. <laughs> Maybe about 10 or 12 years ago, I realized that wasn't Roger Waters. That was David Gilmore. I don't know what's wrong with me. But um, the sax solo it, by Dick Perry is 18 bars. Uh, it's a big one. And there's a guitar solo in 4-4 four, four time. And uh, the sax solo is kind of split into two sections. Like, you notice that there's a big... Um, I don't know how to describe it. I don't know if he's switching from tenor to alter or what, but it's 18 bars. And then the, uh, the guitar solo starts, and it changes from 7-4 to 4-4 four, four time. And it's almost like three different guitar solos. But they're all strung back to back to back. The first one is 20 bars, and then the second one is 24 bars, and the third one is 24 bars. And if you don't believe me, just listen to it and count it, because there are distinct differences between the three guitar solos. And they run back-to-back -back after that saxophone solo. But in total, um, 68 bars total of guitar solo. Uh, that's, that's a lot. And uh, that's why the song is so long, too, at 6 minutes and 23 seconds. And, you know, this, it's a long, it's a pop song, really. It gets a lot of airplay. And I think this was the one single release from the album, is Money. The outro starts at 6.04. It's 12 bars, and it fades into Us and Them. And, um, you know, you hear the guy going, I was getting drunk at the time. You know, it's one of those voiceovers they did. Track six is Us and Them. And again, saxophone by Dick Perry, written by Wright and Waters. It's seven minutes and 48 seconds. Uh, vocals by David in the verses, and then David and Richard in the in the chorus, in the key of D major at 69 beats in 4/4 four, four time. It's pretty standard considering this album. Uh, this is one of the best songs on the album. Also, the intro is 59 seconds, runs from 00 to 59, and it's a 10 bar intro. And the intro is just a real uh, on lead guitar. And then um, at 59 seconds, there's a saxophone solo, and it's a real, um, real somber. Ba -da -ba, ba -da -da. It's a 10-bar um, solo also. The verse is David Gilmore singing us and us, and you can hear the echo, us, 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 and them, and after all, we're only ordinary men. That's a 20-bar verse and an 8-bar chorus. Forward, he cried from the rear in the front rank, died. Uh, this, by the way, it's a military tune, um, you know, something that Roger Waters would visit in all of his lyrics, or not all of his lyrics, but a lot of his lyrics. Um, Richard and David are in vocal harmony in the chorus. Uh, sounds pretty cool, and I think you can hear the, the background singers who did, just are really terrific on this album. You can hear them. Ah! Uh, there's a piano solo of 10 bars at 5 minutes 11 seconds, and then there's a sax minute, uh, a sax solo at 511 to 544 to 609, and it's 10 bars plus 8 bars. So this is another one where the sax solo, the first part is at 10 bars, and then there's a second 8 bars, which sounds like a different solo. It has a lot more bite to it um, than the first part. I, and I... Uh, Maybe that's where I was thinking that he was switching instruments because it definitely goes up. Um, 
but it also goes up in spice too. And that's Dick Perry. He's great. Um, he's really good on these Pink Floyd. Al he's on Wish You Were Here too, and he's on Pulse, and um, I think the Division Bell also. But Us and Them is a longer song at over almost eight minutes. Verse, chorus, verse, chorus. Uh, the piano solo, the sax solos, uh, verse, chorus. And then um, the end of the song is, uh, for want of a slice, for tea and a spice, the old man died. And then it goes right into track seven, Any Color You Like, which is uh, credited to Gilmore and Mason and Wright. It's three minutes and 25 seconds in the key of D minor in 4-4 four, four time. And this is an instrumental. This is the one that goes... It just keeps doing that over again, over and over again. The guitar solo starts at a minute and 20 seconds, and it's really uh, pretty cool playing by David Gilmore. Um, however, the key to the song is the, uh, the first one minute and 20 seconds, the organ and the synth by Roger Waters and Richard Wright, and then Nick Mason's infectious drumming. That's what makes the song. And um, by the way, Roger Waters and Nick Mason, if I haven't said at this point in the on this album, they are amazing. They're like perfect. They're in sync with each other, and their playing is perfect. It's so good that you don't even notice it. Um, but yeah, that's pretty much the song. You know, da -da 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 -da. and then the guitar solo is like a where where da 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 da. Uh, anyway, the synth comes back in around the three minute, three second mark, and then um, the song goes out. The final two tracks are often played together on rock and roll radio. Track eight is Brain Damage, written by Roger Waters. It's three minutes and 50 seconds, and Roger's on lead vocals. And I think this is his only vocals on the album. Uh, key of D major, 130 beats per minute in 3 4 time. It doesn't. I feel like a waltz, but when you count the time, it's... And that's the introduction to the song, the, the, that eight bars of the uh, main lick on lead guitar. The verse is Roger Waters singing, The Lunatic is on the Grass, or Grass as he pronounces it, for 16 bars. And then the bridge part of the song is, And if the dam breaks open many years too soon... And if there is no room... And the background singers are just... It's 16 bars, the bridge. The background vocalists are really powerful at the end of the bridges, um, on this song in particular. And it sounds like... Um, they made it sound like a southern church choir, and they did this little effect to the voices, like a... Wah, like a tremolo type. Uh, it's just terrific. There's a synth solo on Brain Damage... Um, that's part of the outro. It starts at three minutes and five seconds until the, well, it's the last 45 seconds of the song. It ends at 3.50. Uh, you can hear the guy laughing, the ho, 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 ho. And then uh, that, I counted that at 16 bars total, I think. And then in the third verse, you can hear more slide guitar in there. And again, in this song, Nick Mason is a surgeon, just keeping time and has awesome drum fills and He's just amazing. Uh, yeah, brain damage. Verse, verse, bridge, verse, verse, bridge is the um, the song structure. And then that seamlessly goes into Eclipse, which starts with a big organ. It, Eclipse is written by Roger Waters, and it's short at 2 minutes and 6 seconds. Again, Roger's on lead vocals, and the background girls are screaming in the background. And I always like to add how at a one minute and five seconds, you can hear David Gilmore in the background belting out and all that is now in, as the background vocals. Um, Eclipse is also in the key of D major. It's 136 beats per minute in 3-4 time. And the verse is, uh, it starts, and all that you are. Uh, da -da 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 -da, da -da 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 -da. All that you touch and all that you see and all that you taste, all you feel. Those those are eight bar verses. If you look at it um, in the lyrics, it just looks like one long ballad. But it's actually, when you're listening to it, it's pretty clear cut and dry. Those are six verses and an outro. 
And the six verses are eight bars each. You can write that down. Um, the outro is the heartbeat. Uh, bum, 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 bum. And then, you know, that's the end of the album. And what Pink Floyd started doing with this album, and they did this a lot, is the album would begin and end the same way. So you hear the heartbeat at the beginning of the album, and you hear the heartbeat at the end of the album. So that if you just, you know, hit the repeat button, you're just in an endless cycle, in a loop. Okay, that's, uh, that's Eclipse. That's Dark Side of the Moon, my friends. Uh, ooh. It sold a lot. It sold 50 million copies. That was number one in 1973. It's the number one selling record of the 70s. And it's number three all time behind Thriller and Back in Black by ACDC. But it's ahead of Whitney and Bad and Meatloaf and The Eagles and Shania Twain and Backstreet Boys. And it's better than Alanis Morissette, Jagged Little Pill. This is a big album. It's a cult classic, too. I didn't even bring that up. You know, there's there's this whole thing about uh, Dark Side of the Moon and um, uh, The Wizard of Oz. It's not a real thing. I mean, I, I know you can go to YouTube and watch that, but it was that's not intentional. It's not deliberate. At least that's not what David Gilmore said. Uh, okay, back to the back to the movie here. Prodarchives.com is a it gives it a four point six one. That is number six on their top list. Behind the big ones, close to the edge is number one, and then uh, selling England by the pound, which is Genesis in the court of the Crimson King by King Crimson and Wish You Were Here and Thick as a Brick. But it's ahead of Foxtrot, Red Animals, and Fragile. So, um, you know, it's, I don't, I wouldn't say it's, I mean, it is prog, but it's not prog in the same way that those other animal, uh, other albums I just read are, I, I looked at animals and then said that it's not proggy in the same way, but it is prog, but you know, you know what I mean? Uh, allmusic.com gives it five stars and Rolling Stone gives it five stars and everybody gives it five stars and it might be your favorite album, um, I want to read you this paragraph from Wikipedia. The Dark Side of the Moon frequently appears on professional rankings of the greatest albums. In 1987, Rolling Stone ranked it 35th best album of the preceding 20 years. Rolling Stone ranked it number 43 on its 2003 and 2012 lists. And uh, of the those are the 500 greatest albums of all time lists. And number 55 on its 2020 list, Pink Floyd's highest placement. 55 seems pretty low, but... Uh, both Rolling Stone and Q have listed The Dark Side of the Moon as the best progressive rock album. Yeah, you know, it, it has a great reputation. I don't know what else to say about it. If you haven't heard it, you're, you know, as Tony Horton would say, you live under a rock on the moon. And this is Dark Side of the Moon. Album cover by Storm Thorgerson of Hypnosis. Okay, uh, I want to give out to the shout out to the uh, the backing vocalists Doris Troy, Leslie Duncan, Lisa Strike, and Barry St. John because it's they are terrific in every song. Um, that's the end. Next up on the channel will be Lark's Tongue and Aspic by King Crimson, and then probably Houses of the Holy by Led Zeppelin. Thanks everyone. You can leave comments and like and subscribe, please, and keep sending your comments. I do like reading them and responding back to you. So thank you all.